Chris. <laughs> so if you can let me know when we are actually live and people start. We are in. live. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And it is November the 20th. Oh, I'm good. Chris just told me just two minutes ago and I almost forgot then. All right, so it's November the 20th and we are this month. What have we been celebrating? We've been celebrating so many things this month. Of course, we've been celebrating uh, Bonfire Night. Um, is that right? Yes. No. no. That was earlier this month. Oh, it was. We've been <laughs> When was Halloween? Was that this month as well? Just about. <laughs> Can't remember. We've been celebrating Halloween. We've had spooky stories. Actually, that was at the end of last month, I do believe. Um, but we've been celebrating um, Remembrance Day, uh, which to those of you in America is, um, I think, Veterans Day. Is it November 11th when yes. we remember all of our heroes? We should start and call it Heroes Day, actually. Um, and what else have we been celebrating? And of course, we've been celebrating or getting, rearing up, gearing up to Thanksgiving for all of you in America who celebrate Thanksgiving. And I know that um, Thanksgiving is an enormous, enormous holiday for most people in, in this country, in the USA. For me, not so much because, you know, first of all, I'm not an American and second of all, I don't celebrate Thanksgiving. However, I thought I would tell you a story today that involves Thanksgiving just a little bit, but in my way. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Before we begin, first of all, I'd like to say good morning to my spirit guide, Gregor, who is laughing at me right now, chuckling away standing to my right side as always and i would like to say good morning good morning chris good morning rosemary good morning everyone and chris where are you today you're not in vermont today right i'm not in vermont today i am on cape cod where i grew up really and and i know that some of your family still live on cape cod too so you're staying with them right i am so what is the occasion? You see, when you were telling me about it, I thought that you were getting together with all of your family that you would not see at Thanksgiving to have a pre-Thanksgiving thing. However, I'm I'm not right in thinking that, am I, Chris? Would you like to explain it to us? <laughs> oh, this, do we this, have all day? Oh, hold on, hold on. Before you explain it to us, I have to tell everybody, this is so weird. Anyway, go on, Chris. <laughs> all right. Um... We are making a dish from my childhood that my grandmother, who came over to the United States at age 16, kept, uh, kept in the family, let's put it that way. And I liken it to an experience of when the women sat around doing a quilting bee to this experience because we, as a child, we took 100 pounds of potatoes and we peeled them. Yes, but hold on. For how many people was that to feed? My family was nine and we had grandma, so 10. So 100 pounds of potatoes to feed 10 people? Yes. Go ahead. So we peel the potatoes, we grate the potatoes, we strain the potatoes, we add a mixture of flour and egg to the potatoes, we take I think it was, let's say five to six pounds of ground beef, mix it with salt pork, ground allspice and make a meatball. And then we take this potato mixture and wrap it around the meatball. And then we boil it for an hour and you can eat it for dinner, which will be tonight. And then you can slice it up in butter and fry it in the morning for breakfast. So it's non-fattening, Chris. Oh God, no, your stomach blows up like a balloon when you eat these things. <laughs> So tell everyone what they're called or what you call them, your name for them. What is well, your name? As a kid, in my ears, it sounded like K-R-U-P-K-R-O-C-K-E-R. -E but when you look it up online, it's K-R-O-P-P, -P, 
K-A-K-K-O-R. It's a Swedish dish. So crop. I, I just say call it, call it what you crop, like crop, because <laughs> we mess crop, up the name all the time. <laughs> so either crop croppers or crop crackers or something like that anyway. And, and uh, now you're making those today. Your family is downstairs. I understand they've relegated you to one of the bedrooms. You're upstairs. They're moaning and complaining because they thought that the show would only be an hour, which, which meant that, uh, you, you, you know, you'd only escape one hour in the kitchen. Uh, but actually, then you have to come up and then you have to get prepared. And then we have to natter and so on. So they're all complaining that you <laughs> you you wait a minute, we thought it was going to take an hour. You mean you're going to uh, duck out of uh, grating these potatoes and so on? <laughs> so now tell me, how many pounds of potatoes are you using today? I did not get a chance to see the tally because I literally arrived at my brother's house, said, what room are you setting me up in? And they had already started the peeling. But I suspect it's around 60 pounds of potatoes. To feed how many people? Well... We, we can't tell that whole story right now, Rosemary, because that's a surprise. <laughs> okay. Well, we're not going to tell any of the story, but let's suffice it to say there are going to be 11 people around the table, would you say? Something yes. like that? Yes. Yes. And um, and then, of course, you might they might feed you to, to a couple more days after today, right? I mean, you're yes. not going you to... typically make more so you have it the next mornings because honestly... We all argue about, is it best the night before or the day after? And because the anticipation that you only make, I mean, we haven't made these in probably three years. So the anticipation of having them tonight will make, you know, it seem even better than it is. But then the smell of it frying in the frying pan in the morning, whoo, everybody gets up whether you want to or not, because you just, you just have to. Okay, right. Now I'm going to tell you that uh, I'm looking forward to you posting a picture of those when they're done, when they're on your plate, we want to see them. We want to see what exactly what they look like. We want you to cut one in half for us and photograph that and show us what it looks like inside. Right, everybody? Yes. Okay. They don't sound so great to me, but, hey, you know, they're, maybe they're really, really delicious. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, I don't, they don't sound as if they're for me, but... Uh, at the same time, if I were there, well, let me put it this way, everybody, had I been invited, which of course I wasn't, I might have said, oh, well, I'll have a taste of these. Uh, we would love to know if any of you out there have any weird and wonderful recipes that you're going to be making, either in, even for the next few days or weeks, for, for Thanksgiving or for Christmas. We want to hear of your strange perhaps family traditions that's what we want to hear from you um we know that uh, after after I, we're not sure yet are we chris either after thanksgiving or christmas it depends where chris is going to be because i know she's off to texas at some point um but um uh, sometime after christmas uh, either thanksgiving or christmas and my cooking show is going to be all about the leftovers what can we do? We, you know, we produce all of this food for Thanksgiving. We produce all of this food for Christmas. And I produce a lot of food for Christmas. What on earth do you do with it all once, you know, what are you going to do with leftover turkey? The next day, nice sandwiches. Yes, fine. But then if you have a turkey as big as mine, then, then what? You've still got meat. You've still got bone. What are you going to do with that stuff? Um, and uh, so we're going to be talking about... Um, what on earth should we do with those wonderful leftovers? Because I think I've got a few tips for you and I'm going to be taking some of those leftovers and uh, showing you what I like to do with mine. But I'd love to hear from all of you. First of all, it, do you have a special family tradition food that you like to cook? Or do you have something special that you love to cook uh, in the leftover line. So that's that. All right. So now then, it is Saturday morning, as you all know. So we have to begin our story time. First of all, Chris, do we have anybody? Is, wait, wait, is there anybody? I almost forgot. Is there anybody there? Oh, yes. Yes. We have plenty of people in the chat room, all raring to go. All right. So here is my story for this uh, week, once upon a time. Now, this is not a Thanksgiving story because, um, 
Well, because uh, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving, but uh, I know that many of you like to hear stories of my childhood. And I told you a, a story last week, which was uh, has all of my life really inspired me um, to know that I'm on the right track. If you remember, it was about my father giving me a stone and saying to me, make your heart like this stone. No, I don't think so. Anyway, if you missed that story, you can find it on YouTube. Just go to my YouTube channel and there it will be for you. This morning's story is very different and it's a lovely, a really nice story. I promise you, it is a childhood story that you are going to love. So, all right. So once upon a time when I was a little girl, <laughs> I feel as if I'm talking to Reese. Once upon a time when I was a little girl, I would probably be around maybe four or five years old at the time, quite young. Um, my mother used to uh, send me for the for the for the entire summer to um, to a lady named Mrs. Lowesby. Now, Mrs. Lowesby was a friend of a friend of my mother's, or she was actually a friend of someone who worked with my mother. And um, so my mother used to send me to her and she lived way across the other side of the city. And of course, when I first went there, I, I knew her not. I knew nothing about it, didn't know anything about it at all. So anyway, so when you are sort of, let's say I was four or five years old, let's say I was five years old, something like that. Uh, I was very, very shy and I was very, very timid. And so I arrived somehow no idea how i got there but i arrived at mrs lowsby's house very nervous very unsure now when when i was little during you know sort of uh, during different holidays and also you know uh sometimes if it was school holidays during the summertime my mother would um what she would call she we we would be minded out which meant we would be given to other people to 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 babysitters, I suppose. That that's what it was. And I was minded out before Mrs. Lowesby, I was minded out to this uh lady who lived uh, just down the street. She was terrifying. First of all, not that she could help it in any way. She uh, she had uh, one of her shoes ha was um was built up. So she had, you know, so she limped. Uh, now, re remember, I was, uh, when I started going to this person, I might have been only two years old or something, up to being four or five when I went to Mrs. Lowesby. Anyway, um, and uh, um, this lady was, she was very stern, she was very strict. And uh, you'd go to her house and she would put you in a chair, she would put you in an armchair, and you'd have to sit there and not move and not speak and um, I would sit there absolutely terrified because if you moved she would yell at you and she would do a housework all around you she would vacuum she would dust and her house was as neat as a pin actually and she would do all the housework around you and you dare not move you can imagine being you know three years old and four years old and, you know sort of absolutely scared not to move now I'd come out of one household where I was scared. The household I lived in was, you know, you you were you had to do what you were told and you were terrified to do anything that you were told not to do. So in one way it was easy for me to obey. When you're a kid and somebody you're afraid of tells you to do something, that's what you do. She was never kind. She was never nice. There was never a, a kind word. Um, but she used to always have on the radio I'm sort of digressing from my nice story now. I'll I'll get back to it. I promise. Anyway, she would you she would always play the radio and um, uh, at eleven a.m. every single morning on the radio there would be they would call it music while you work and it was for the housework wives who stayed at home and it always had its own signature tune and I can remember even into my teens and even if someone played that tune for me now it would spin me right back to this dreadful time where I was a little girl, terrified, sitting in that chair. 
And every time I used to hear that, even when I was growing up and even as I got older, because, you know, it was music while you work went on for years on the radio. Uh, it would bring me back to that time of this this lady with her, we used to, she used to call it a club foot, and her terrifying, um, the ter this just the absolute fear of not daring to move while I was there with her. Now we get to the good bit, okay? So now, for whatever reason, um, at some point when I was around four or five years old, um, Mrs. Lowe's became along. And Mrs. Lowesby would have me for Easter's, summer's, any long school holidays. So Easter would be something like three weeks. The summer would be eight weeks. Uh, even at Christmas, before Christmas, she would she would take me. But here we here I am. The first time I went there, and I was absolutely terrified of Mrs. Lowesby. I didn't know her. I didn't know who she was. Didn't know anything about her. She was an old lady. Um, and I was, she told me I was allowed to call her Auntie Lowesby. So from then on and for the rest of my life, she was known to me as Auntie Lowesby. Now, Auntie Lowesby was not so stern, a little bit strict, but I was still terrified of her. I was only a little girl. And, and uh, anyway, I remember the very first, one of the very first days uh, she brought me into the kitchen with her. And uh, she kept chickens. And she said to me, I'm going to show you how to make some mash. Do you want to help me? And mash was all the potato peelings and all of the awful stuff, all of that, whatever it was that went into this bowl. And then we'd go out into the chicken coop, which was a big chicken coop. And we'd open the gate and walk inside. And she'd allow me to throw the mash to the chickens. And she'd allow me to throw corn to the chickens. And... Uh, and you can imagine now I'm not so scared. I'm not so frightened of her at all. Um, she also had a piano. And she would play the piano for me. And we would sing hymns. And uh, she loved singing hymns. My Auntie Lois loved singing hymns. And one of her favorite hymns was Onward Christian Soldiers. And even now, all of these so many years later, when I hear that uh, being sung, I, I'm immediately taken back to my Auntie Lowesby. We would sit on the piano stool together and she would pound out on with Christian soldiers and we would both be singing away and other hymns as well, but that seemed to be her favourite. Now, <clears throat> okay, Auntie Lowesby had a son and uh, his name was Tony and I was allowed to call him Uncle Tony and Uncle Tony had a wife who was whose name was Sheena and I was allowed to call her Auntie Sheena. Now Uncle Tony and Auntie Sheena were I think fairly newly married when I came into their lives and they would have lots of fun and they would come at the weekends and every every Sunday they would Auntie, Auntie uh, Sheena and Uncle Tony uh, were there for meals. I, I don't remember if they lived in the same house. I cannot remember that that much about it, but they were always there. And, and I remember my very first Sunday lunch, roast beef, and the biggest and the highest and the most spectacular Yorkshire pudding you have ever seen in your entire life. My Auntie Lowesby used to make her Yorkshire puddings in a cake tin and they would rise right up and um uh the four of us would sit around the table now when i was at home with my parents seen and not heard was the rule uh auntie Lowesby's table was really very different and uh, you know they would talk to each other they would make jokes they would make me giggle um, Uncle Tony would often strive to make me giggle and giggle and giggle. Now, the very first Sunday tea we had um, involved cake, pastries, uh, sandwiches, I don't know, jellies. It was like, oh, what was it? It was like Thanksgiving. Food spread all over the table like you've never seen, right? Or should I say like I've never seen? 
because the only time we had a spread like that at my house when I was growing up was Christmas time. So every Sunday we would have, Auntie Lowe's, we would, we would have our Sunday tea. And then after tea, we'd sit and, and uh, watch a little bit of television or something. I don't remember what we'd do. And then she would uh, take me to the bus and uh, we'd get on the bus and she'd take me and drop me off to where my parents were. But remember, uh, in the holidays, I was there for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks the most joyful, the most thanksgiving, the most wonderful time of my life growing up was with my Auntie Lowsby, my Auntie Sheena and my Uncle Tony. So here we have every week this incredible spread of food and it became very quickly known that my favourites, my very favourite of all of the foods that would appear on the table for our Sunday tea were lemon curd tarts. I don't think you can you make them here in the States anyway, but any anybody anybody who knows anything about British food knows jam tarts and lemon curd tarts are the, are the thing, right? Anyway, uh, so it became very quickly known that the lemon curd tarts were my favourites. And so it was sort of like this amazing spread. They're just exactly as some of you are going to have next Thursday. You come to the table and there's all this amazing food there. When I was a little girl and, and sort of, you know, three, sorry, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I was still going to Auntie Lowsby's. Um, and uh, I would look every time and anticipate the lemon curd tarts. And after the first couple of weeks that I was there, uh, I would go to the table and I would sit, you know, sort of we'd all have to stand behind our chairs and then we were given the go ahead to sit down and we'd say grace. And as we're saying grace, I would be sort of looking under my eyelashes to sort of to look at the food to see. I was amazed at all the food that they had, all the incredible food that they had. And of course, my eyes were searching and searching for the lemon curd tarts. And I can remember the very first time, which was only a couple of weeks after I'd been there for the first time, there were no lemon curd tarts and I could feel my oh, my disappointment, but that's all right because everything else was, was jam tarts or everything else, but no lemon curd tarts. And so we'd sit down and this became a ritual over the years, okay? So Auntie Lowsby would then look at Uncle Tony and say, Uncle Tony, what happened to the lemon curd tarts? Now, when she said that, I knew there might be some and I would start to giggle. He'd say, I don't know, I've not had the lemon curd tarts. And he'd look at Sheena, Auntie Sheena, he'd say, have you had the lemon curd tarts? And she'd say, no, I haven't had the lemon curd tarts. And then Auntie Lowsby would say again, are you sure? And all this time, they would go around and around because they loved to hear me giggle. They loved to hear me laugh. I was such a shy little girl, barely able to say anything to anybody and only spoke when I was spoken to. And it was their mission. They made it their mission whenever I was with them to make me giggle, to make me laugh, to make me feel comfortable. And at some point out from under the table, Uncle Tony would produce the plate of lemon curd tarts and there would be a big smile across my face and all of them were smiling and I was smiling. It was perhaps my Thanksgiving every Sunday that I stayed with them, every time I went to visit them. Um, I remember once I was, a bit, I was very sick and I had to stay in bed so they brought me coloring books. Who, who would imagine that they'd bring you things when we was, when I was sick at home, you laid in bed and that was the end of that. You might have got a book if you were lucky, but usually you just stayed in bed and, and, uh, and you were left to your own devices. They brought me coloring books and they brought, you know, would bring me reading books and then they'd bring me something to drink and then, and, and I would, I was so happy there. And as a little girl, I would, I loved to sing. And 
some of you who know me know that right now. Uh, and I would, I remember this one particular day and I was coloring away, I was sitting up in bed and I wasn't very well, but I was singing away, humming away and coloring away like a happy child, like a child who was loved, like a child who was enjoying what she was doing. And I was singing away to myself and just nobody around. Everybody else was downstairs or out or doing something. And uh, when I finished this particular song, all of a sudden, applause came from the foot of the stairs and cheers from Uncle Tony. And, and they'd all been listening to me and appreciating me and loving me. Um, that didn't last forever and ever, even though I'd have liked it to have done. But one day, Auntie Lozby came to me and told me that um, Auntie Sheena was having a baby and then there was no room for me anymore. Uh, so the Easter holidays and the summer holidays, the Christmas holidays, all the holidays in between that I would go to the Lozby's, uh, they stopped. But I never forgot those times, ever. I don't think they forgot those times either. They were my special holiday times. When Samantha was a little girl, we would always have Sunday tea. Well, yes, we'd always have Yorkshire pudding for lunch too. But tea, our tea, was a spread. It was... Um, Yes, you guessed it. It was uh, lemon curd tart. It was some um, cream horns. It was different pastries. I used to make my own bread. And uh, we'd be sitting down. I'd lay the table out. We'd be sitting down. And we'd always have this big, big fancy tea. And um, a knock would come at the door. And, you know, we had friends who lived a couple of hours away. They'd just say, oh, let's go for a drive. And they'd always end up with us. <laughs> sharing tea and other people would come and share tea um, but Samantha and I would spend just as I used to do from time to time with my auntie Lowesby Samantha and I would spend time on Saturday and Sunday baking and cooking and doing all of those things nowadays I notice that uh, you know somebody will have make a plate of something and they'll go off and eat it in their room or somebody else will have a tray in their room or rarely do you see families sitting together around the table rarely do you see families having dinner together when my daughter was growing up i feel like my mother now though when i was young when we, when we had our young children i feel like an old woman myself but we always sat at the table for dinner every day every day of the week we always sat at the table for dinner and uh, we always had a, a, a main course and a dessert. Uh, even when I had no money, I'd scratch something together. But it was important to me that we all sat around the table because that was the time, unlike my own childhood, that was the time when, you know, Samantha could tell us about school or we could talk to each other. We, we sort of had, you know, we had fun together at the table and it was a family time. I think it's absolutely wonderful that people celebrate Thanksgiving. I think it's absolutely wonderful that at least one day of the year all the family get together and have a feast of one kind or another. I also think it's important that we remember those people who cannot afford the feasts or have nowhere to go or have no one to celebrate with. And I know a lot of you listening, you know, maybe you have a neighbor who is by themselves and you invite them or maybe you know somebody who is by themselves or you share somehow or another because that's what Thanksgiving is all about. This time that I had with my Auntie Lowesby was, I think, the first time in my young childhood that I experienced true kindness. I was thinking the other day about uh, my life and you know i told the story last week about when my father gave me the stone and i think that that was in in his weird way that was my father's act of kindness to me but in my house growing up kindness was missing 
kindness was lacking. Certainly gentleness was missing. Gentleness was lacking. I think that whenever we sit around a table together, whether it's because you're celebrating Thanksgiving or whether it's because you're celebrating Christmas, I think it's really important. And my Auntie Lowesby taught me this. And my Uncle Tony and my Auntie Sheena, they taught me these things. And if their family happens to be listening at some point, you know, they should be proud because these people showed me how you can live and how you can be kind and how you can have fun even if it's only to a little girl who's a stranger in your midst whose mother just sent her off because well it was easier to send her off than to take care of her wasn't it the motives for my mother sending me to my auntie Lowsby may have been dearly and clearly lacking in kindness i was just to be shoved off what she didn't realize and what I am so grateful for when I think of Thanksgiving and when I think of all the things that I should be thankful for in my life, my Auntie Lowesby stands out as one of those wonderful, quiet heroes because she, she was a hero, she is a hero to me and I know, I'm sure, because um, the way that she and her son and daughter-in-law reacted with each other i know that they were heroes to each other too we all need heroes in our lives our children need heroes our children need heroes to look up to during this coming thanksgiving uh, what i would love for you to do is to think about that and not just show kindness and gentleness but maybe uh, be a hero for your family in some small way or another. Um, I know that I'm going to be a little hero for my grandson because the next time I go visit them, and I've never done this before, would you believe it? I'm going to make him lemon curd tarts. The English way. Yeah, good. My way, maybe. <laughs> I'm going to make him lemon curd tarts and I'm going to tell him the story of how uh, one of my heroes was my Auntie Lowesby, who gave me joy and made me realise and made me see, not by what she said, but by her actions and the actions of Uncle Tony and Auntie Sheena. They showed me how you can be. My parents taught me how not to be. My Auntie Lowesby taught me how to be. Find joy, find fun, find happiness and give in the best way that you can. You don't have to give with money. You don't have to shower people with expensive gifts. Just small acts of kindness are so important. And I will always, always be grateful for those acts of kindness that Auntie Lowesby and her family showed to me. The end. There you go, Chris. Did you like that story? Oh, I'm, I'm both um, very much touched, a little bit melancholy, oh, a no. lot of bit grateful that knowing some little bits and parts of your, your life that you did have those moments. And I can think of always uh, at your table, the graciousness you've shown oh. all of us. Um, and we may have Auntie Lowesby to thank for that. <laughs> oh, I think you do. <laughs> I definitely think you do. <laughs> um, so I don't think you've ever heard that story before, have you? No, I don't think so. Uh, you see, I've got lots of stories up my sleeve, things I don't tell people, you know, and it's not that I don't tell because I don't want you to know. It's just that I have so many stories to tell. <clears throat> so you can see now why I'm saying to people, if you have a, a story like that, or, you know, all of my life from, from then on, after my time with Auntie Lowesby, lemon curd tarts were my favorite. And I love lemon curd and uh, making lemon curd is so easy to, um, you know, it was very hard. I, I'm not sure actually if you can find lemon curd now in the stores here in the States, but in certain stores, 
you never come across it. In England, everybody, nobody doesn't know what lemon curd tarts are. A good pastry filled with lemon curd and baked in the oven. It's as simple and easy as that. But these were good. These were <laughs> delicious. And, um, you know, if you have a special story or if you have a something special that you make, like uh, Chris's, I'm going to get it wrong, cro <laughs> crookers or cro crockers or whatever they are, if you have that special something that you make or you have a, a memory of your grandmother making something for you or, or even your grandfather because men cook just as well as women. If you do something that is a traditional thing to do, um, you know, uh, let us know because we would love to share what you have to say to us. So, Chris, I think that was an awfully long story. So why don't we now go to comments and questions? Absolutely. Linda says, good morning. Good Onward Christian Soldiers reminds me of Sunday school. Thank you so much for the memory. A oh, co-worker's yeah. family just lost a precious baby girl, stillborn, full term. Please add this special angel to your prayers. Thank we you. We will. Thank you. Thank you for asking us, and we definitely will. We definitely will. Judith says, despite all, we hold hands and give thanks. Also, Thanksgiving is a time we donate to charities, oh. and some of us are young and healthy enough to donate time for others. It's a beautiful season. I think that, uh, you know, I mean, I know that there are, there are a lot of people who every Christmas they will, you know, what they do is instead of uh, buying Chris presents for people, they will say, I'm donating to, and my, my favorite uh, um, charity is St. Jude's um, because they do the most amazing um, things. And St. Ormond's in London is also an amazing hospital. Um, so a lot of people, instead of buying Christmas presents, they'll, they'll say to you, I, I've sent the money that I would spend for you, I've sent it to St. Jude's or they, they send it to their favorite charity, whatever that is, which is wonderful. And these charities, they need our money. Having said that, I always think it's a bit of a cop-out to just send money. Uh, it might not be a cop-out for a lot of people. A lot of people are busy. A lot of people have don't have the time or the energy. They don't even know how to begin or where to begin to volunteer their time. Uh, but if you have any queries or any questions about, well, I wouldn't know what to do, I'll give you a few suggestions believe you me um but um i always uh, feel that uh, as as well as donating the money i think it's more important to, at least equally important to give your time and your energy to be there to either visit st jude's or to visit a children's hospital or to visit a a, a home i was i was placed into a children's home twice when I was little, another story, other stories for other time. And I know how it felt to be one of those kids who is, you know, I mean, I wasn't an orphan, uh, and it, but it was like an orphanage. It was a children's home. And um, the stigma that other kids at, at school, you know, that the kids, at, the kids in these homes go through with other kids at school um uh, the stigma that uh, you know that often kids go through if they you know if they are fostered out and so on so we can help by giving our time and by giving you know whatever we can give of our time and also financially if we can afford it but for those of you who can't afford it financially come on there's always enough time on your hands in your pocket that you can share with other people if you need to, and if you're determined to, which I'm going to suggest, please think about it. Because that's what Thanksgiving is about, isn't it? Being grateful for what we have, but also spreading that kindness and that gentleness to others. My Auntie Lowesby, my Uncle Tony, and my Auntie Sheena showed me, probably for the first time in my young life, they showed me kindness. I didn't know what that was. I had no clue. They showed me gentleness. 
I was very wary of it, you can imagine. I'd never experienced that before. But once you've experienced it, you know that if someone can give it to you, then as you get older, you can give it to others. That's the point, isn't it? Chris. Carolyn says, this wonderful family were your heroes. Their joy sounded wonderful. They were definitely my heroes. All right. Judith says, a character on the Brit com, as time goes by, oh, yes. always <laughs> eats lemon curd tarts. Judy does. <laughs> Ju okay. That was the first time I heard of them. And I'm so glad you have these few happy memories from your childhood. Yeah, let's not get too bogged down in the miserable memories. Because let me tell you, I have lots of wonderful memories. I have the memory of uh, Christmas morning and finding the only wrapped present, because my mother used to put, uh, you know, she had, there were four of us. She didn't have time to wrap presents and uh, so all of our presents were put into a pillowcase. Uh, but there was always at least one wrapped present, and sometimes very often two. And I knew straight away that they were from Auntie Lowesby. And they were always the same thing, a pair of mittens knitted by her and a, and a knitted scarf. She always sent me a scarf and gloves, which was lovely. Look, I grew up in a in a, an unhappy household and there were lots of things that weren't right with that household. However, don't get the impression that I was, you know, miserable every day of the week because I was not. I mean, you know, I went to school, made friends at school. Uh, you know, I had my music. I was able to play the piano when I got lonely, you know, there are a lot of people who did not have it nearly as good as me. So let's not get bogged down with poor Rosemary and what she had to deal with. Because thank goodness that poor Rosemary had to deal with that stuff because it made me the person I am today. Kind, hopefully kind, a gracious host, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> as Chris said, I love to cook. I love to have family. I love to have my house filled with people. Because when I was a kid, we were never allowed to have people come visit. We're never allowed to have friends in uh, unless, you know, on occasion. Um, but it was a place you never wanted to invite your friends anyway. So, you know, please let's not get bogged down with the things that we don't have or didn't have. And let's think about the joyful things that we did have. Chris. Maggie has a question. Yes, Maggie. My sister made a dream catcher for me years ago. Oh, nice. I had it in two houses that were not very happy. Now at the new house, it broke. Does that mean it did its job and now for new? Well, first of all, Maggie, I think it's the Maggie. I'm so sorry about yesterday. I did try and try and try. I don't know what went wrong there, but we will sort something out for you. The dream catcher, maybe it means you don't need it anymore. Maybe all your dreams are coming true, Maggie. And that's what I hope for you. We'll talk about it more, hopefully next week. Chris. Janina says, beautiful story about your kind auntie. I wonder if it's my neighbor, Janina, who's sort of clicking. It's an unusual name, isn't it, Janina? Anyway, if it is, hi. <laughs> If it isn't, I love the name. <laughs> Chris. Sandra says, lemon curd is my favorite. Oh. Please show us how to make it sometime. Oh, yes. Well, well, I need the right. Here, you see, now you've set me off because I can't make lemon curd tarts because you don't use muffin pans because they're too deep. You need shallow pans. If anybody in England could get me some nice shallow pans, I have to ask my friend, uh, my, my two friends, my two K KK and RA, the Cracking Up crew, I have to ask them if they could find me some shallow pans for my lemon curd tarts. Chris. Carolyn is also asking, will you teach us to make lemon curd tarts, please, please? Well, it's easy. If you can make pastry uh, and you can either buy the lemon curd or you can make lemon curd, easy. 
very easy, both of them. Uh, you've cracked it, but absolutely, definitely, I can certainly show you how to make lemon curd tarts. Who knew that they would become the new thing? Chris. <laughs> Maggie says, my dad's tradition was to pour beer in meat dishes when he walked by with a can in his hand and drove my mom crazy. <laughs> well, actually, beer is really good in meat dishes for breaking down the fibers in meat and making the meat more tender. Uh, at the same time, you can use Coca-Cola, would you believe? You can use beer, you can use stout is really, really excellent for it. Uh, but you see, your mum used to go crazy. It probably annoyed her thoroughly, but he knew what he was doing, obviously. <laughs> Chris. Carlos is on. Hi, Carlos. Good morning, Rosemary and Chris. The grandfather of my grandmother was a shaman. Oh. I feel the call of to follow his path. Wow. But I have fear. Maybe when I vibrate low, I don't move. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you have to go with your feelings. You have to go with your instincts. If you're, it would be your great grandfather, I think, from what I'm hearing, right? I think that's yes. right. It would be your great grandfather. If he was a shaman, then it's probably something that does run through the family. It probably is something that you might uh, perhaps relate to or be able to connect with. Just go slowly. Find a good teacher. Hard to find, but find a good teacher. All right. The next one's from Sandra saying, I make all your recipes. They okay. always turn out great. And thank you for all you do. Well, listen, Sandra, we want to know what recipes you've tried that you enjoy. So come on, let's hear about it. Chris. <laughs> Barb is saying, thinking how much fun it would be, Rosemary, for you to make the lemon curd and Chris's dish on your next cooking show. <laughs> well, yeah, right. Well, I'm not going to make those cro crookers or cro crockers or whatever they are. I'm not oh, you those. are mangling that First name. of all, my darling, it takes hours. How many hours does it take to make a crop crocker? Crop crop crocker. We start in the morning like a nine a.m. and if we're eating by five, we're doing a, a good a good job. Yes, so it's but an all day but, affair. But yeah, it's all day. However, how many people are having to do it? Because you're not doing it by yourself, are you? Right. I mean, as kids, it was all hands on deck. I think we're going to have maybe six of us making them today. They're down one by me and, you know, I'm so the pro, six so. Of you taking like nine two. or ten hours each. I don't think we can do them on the cooking show, number one. And number <laughs> two, that's Chrissy's recipe. I'm not getting involved in that. I would eat them. I might even want to sort of get involved in sort of seeing how they're made. Um, here's my trouble. This is an awful thing for me to, to, to say to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I'm so ashamed of myself when I tell you this, right? Somebody can give me a recipe. Uh, every now and again, not that often, but every now and again, I'll eat something that I think is so delicious, it's worth my time and effort recreating or making. Or I'll go to somebody's house for dinner and say, do you think I could have the recipe for that? Um, because it's so, so good. But this is what happens. Because... I think it, I don't know if it's an ego thing. I have no idea what it is. I am given a recipe or I find a recipe and I look at it and then I think to myself, I'm reading the recipe, I'm thinking, well, well that looks good. And then I'm thinking, but I bet it would be good if I added a bit of this or maybe changed a little of that. I can never stick to a recipe. I always think I know best, see? I think it must be my ego or whatever it is. I'm, I'm ashamed of myself to tell you this. I've never, or very rarely anyway, followed a recipe that I've been given. I've just got to fiddle with it and make it my own. And um, I'm not always right. Sometimes I think, no, I shouldn't have put this in. it. So then I'll fiddle with it some more until I do make it my own. I can never, ever take a recipe and just do it as I'm told to do it. 
I'm ashamed to tell you that. Right, Chris. <laughs> Jesus. Even the even the crop crookers, if I were there, I'd say, well, what if you tried this? Or have you thought about putting this in? And always looking to sort of, you know, anyway. I'm ashamed. We'll have to, the very next time we schedule this, Rosemary, invite you to the big family gathering to make crop crockers. Oh, but you wouldn't want me there because I'd interfere. <laughs> I just like, and we'd shoot it. you down to say, no, this isn't what, how Grandma yeah, well, taught us good, this. Yeah, well, good, because... Well, actually, I probably wouldn't interfere. But then if there was so, that delicious, I think, I know myself, gosh, these are so delicious. Then I go away and tweak them or play about with it or something. I don't know what's the matter with me. Anyway, there we are. It's one Judith, of my little foibles. <laughs> Judith wants to know how your Christmas cake is coming along. Oh, feeding beautifully. I had a friend over for dinner. I made... Uh, baked uh um, sorry um so sort of parmesan encrusted crod cod I, which i bake in the oh gosh it was so delicious and my friend came over and then i made some creme patissiere and filled some little uh phyllo pastry cases and it was a really nice dinner just the two of us uh and then just as she's about to leave i said she said to me oh, did you make your christmas cake and i said yes so we came back i opened it i unwrapped it she put her i said put your nose in there and she just put her nose in and said oh you're gonna have to show me how to make that uh, yes it's coming along beautifully this weekend we'll see its fourth feeding uh so well in time for christmas i usually feed it five or six times and and then i'm going to freeze it and then when it's and it doesn't actually freeze because there's too much alcohol in it but it sort of gets sort of solid and then I wrap it tightly and post it off and uh, then it's perfect for decorating when we get there. Anyway, that's, we don't, that's it. Uh, sorry, talking far too long about the Christmas cake, but it's smelling good. Carolyn wants, um, well, she's saying Scottish shortbread. She'd love to learn how to make that. Easy. Oh, I love shortbread. Would you like, you know, I'll maybe show you how to make some shortbread on one of my, on one of the shows. I'll show you how to make shortbread. It is so easy. It is so simple and it is so delicious and you can do so much with it. You can dip it in chocolate. You can uh, sort of finely chop nuts and press them on to, into the top before you bake it. Uh, what else can you do with shortbread? Oh, well, my grandson, my grandson's favorite is to, uh, you know, I coat one half of the shortbread with chocolate and he loves to get his fingers in and do that with me. Uh, so, yes, so chocolate covered shortbreads are his favorite. And actually, the recipe is in my cookbook if you want to find out how to how to make it. But it's the simplest, the easiest. And the only thing you have to know really is don't handle it too much. Chris. All right. Well, we're getting close to time. Um, did you want to mention the event you have coming up? Go ahead. All right. So December 11th, Rosemary's going to be doing a messages from the spirit world on Eventbrite is the sign up. I'm putting uh, the link into the chat room now. So even if you can't make it, we would really appreciate if you sent it out on all of your social media to let others know about the event. We're going to be spending a good three hours Grey Eagle and I are uh, talking to the spirit world, giving messages to as many people as we can who join the event, giving messages from their loved ones in the spirit world, uh, talking about, you know, um, what messages mean. It's, an, it's a, such an insp inspirational thing. I think we've done it twice now, Chris, or three times. I can't remember. But it's a it's an amazing event. It's a an incredible event, and it's you know it's a Christmas special for us. We're doing it in December the eleventh, uh, so that all of you get messages. We'll be sitting at your Christmas table, smiling away to yourselves, knowing that your loved ones in the spirit world are going to be right by your side. So we're going to be giving messages upon messages upon messages, and it's incredible. We we love it, and the people who join in love it, and it's. An opportunity for you, you know, what perhaps you wouldn't normally get or you wouldn't normally be able to afford. It's an opportunity for you to sort of uh, potentially to get a message from your loved ones in the spirit world. Chris. Well, one of the other things, Rosemary, you and I were talking about this week 
was um, what other types of events people might like. And we were thinking about um, either yes, a survey we, or asking people. Yeah, we would like some ideas from you as to, you know, what kinds of things and maybe, you know, Chris, we're going to sort of send out a survey so you could answer that for us and tell us what are the topics that you would really love for us to talk about? Um, we're also, is it this coming Monday, Chris, or haven't we decided yet? We're going to have the cracking up. Is it this coming Monday or is it the following Monday we're going to do? Well, I think maybe you've been speaking with the K's and you'll let me know. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then. I think I've sort of dropped the ball somewhere or another. But we are going to be having our cracking up. K for K, R A for me, Rosemary Altea, and K for K. So crack, cracking up, we're going to call it. It's going to be the three Brits, the three British ladies. We're going to be reminiscing. We're going to be talking about things in the past. My one friend, Kay, uh, is a student of mine, has been a student of mine for many, many, many years. So once you're a student, you're always a student, I guess. But she uh, is a healer in her own right. She's been a healer for many years. Uh, she was one of the first people who came into my um the healing organization and so she knows an awful lot we've got some fantastic and very funny stories to tell you about our travels uh and our experiences but my other friend Kay, Kay from hong kong k because that's where i met her that's where she was living when i met her so um so we call her chaotic because because she is uh, and she's fantastic and she was for most of her career she was a a nurse she's retired but we have stories to tell you about hong kong we have stories to tell you about uh, you know the things that we've done together the things that we've experienced she is the funniest person i think on this planet uh she's really funny she tells some great jokes but we're just going to be having a the three of us we really i'm not sure if we care whether you're going to join us or not because it's just the three of us just cracking up we're going to be having lots of fun. We're going to be talking. We're going to be sharing stuff that we that we've uh, shared with each other over the years. And uh, we just thought that because uh, the last time the two of them were on with me, people said, "Oh, we want to know more about them. We want, you know, we can can they do this again?" So we're doing it again. So it's going to be called cracking up, and it's probably in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll get Thanksgiving over, I think. Get Chris back. Uh, and uh, then we'll do our cracking up show and it will probably be on Monday Monday or Tuesday nights. I'm not sure which it is, uh, whichever's best convenient for them. I think maybe, I don't remember. Anyway, we'll let you know. So watch for that, cracking up. The three, uh, I'd like to say, um, you know, when um, uh, I can remember, this is a funny story, actually, I'll tell you this story. When... Eartha Kitt came to England. Most of you will know who Eartha Kitt is. And if you don't know who Eartha Kitt is, shame on you. Find out who she is because she's the most amazing and incredible, wonderful what entertainer. She's amazing. And she's always she's another of my heroes, actually, if you listen to her story. She's amazing. And um, <laughs> in England, we have this song. And you may have it here in the States. But I'm not sure. Um, uh, and uh, the song in England is, Oh dear, what can the matter be? Uh, three old ladies locked in the lavatory. They were there from Sunday to Saturday. Nobody knew they were there. That's the song. We sing that song. So all about the three old ladies. So, um, <laughs> so Eartha Kitt came to England and she was, she was, she has a song, uh, that she sings one of her very famous songs that she sings. And it's about Creole ladies, Creoles, the Creoles being the, uh, you know, French and um, anyway, I'm not quite sure of the history, but she was singing about Creole ladies. And, uh, she, <laughs> and I was so into this and she was, you know, I loved the way she sang and I loved what she did. I loved the way she entertained. And I remember one Sunday night, we were watching the Sunday night at the London Palladium and there was Eartha Kitt singing about Creoles and Creole ladies and sort of really sort of going it. And afterwards, I'm singing to myself, I'm on the sofa and I'm singing it to myself and I'm singing three old ladies. 
not Creole ladies, I heard <laughs> three old ladies. And um, I can never sing three old ladies locked in the lavatory without thinking of Eartha Kitt now because that's not what she was singing. But anyway, we are going to be on our cracking up show. We're going to be three old ladies. I'm much older than they are, <laughs> but we're going to be three old British ladies. Um, not locked in the lavatory, uh, but uh, we're going to be on a show and having a lot of fun doing it. So watch for that. It's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Chris. All right. Well, you're right at time, Rosemary. Uh, there were two comments um, from Carolyn and Dee asking, will you be able to do another Angels event like last Christmas? We are thinking of doing that. Uh, it's We may do it, actually. We may do it for the new year. Um, maybe those of you who were at the Angel Seminar, because we did, we did have a wonderful experience. If you could write to us and tell us specifically what it was that you liked about our Angel uh, uh, webinar, um, because a webinar is only just a seminar. It's just a group of people getting together. Don't be put off by the word webinar, everybody, because it just means a group of people getting together. Uh, either using Zoom or whatever it is that you use, and we have an amazing time. We would very much like to do an angel uh, webinar. Um, we just, it's difficult to be able to fit it all in, uh, but certainly we will be doing something either uh, just after Christmas or maybe even for the new year. That might be our Jan January uh, webinar, so just watch out for that. But for those of you who watch the angel webinar, if you'd like to sort of uh, write to us and tell us what it was about that webinar that was so special to you and so wonderful for you, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, of course, um, with Grey Eagle's help, we can produce something again that is really wonderful. Remember for our webinar on the 11th, which is talking to people in the spirit world and giving messages from the spirit world, I will be with Grey Eagle and he will be directing the whole thing and we will be sitting down for... Can you imagine if you were given an opportunity to sit for three hours with your loved ones in the spirit world? Wouldn't you want it? Wouldn't you take it? Wouldn't you say yes? That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be sitting for three hours with those in the spirit world and trying our very best to give as many messages out as we can. Okay, I think that's it. I know that Chris's family want her downstairs with the cro crockers or whatever they call them. Uh, and so I just would like to say thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate you keep, you know, you just keep coming back to us and we love it. Can I ask you please to hashtag and can I ask you please share, 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 share. If you love this show, please share it with all of your friends and let them have a taste of what it is that we do. I'd like to say thank you to you, Chris, for coming away from the kitchen. Are you, are you, have you got your sleeves rolled up ready? Are you preparing yourself? Just now? about. <laughs> you got your apron on yet? <laughs> ready to get ready to get, dive into those grated potatoes or whatever it is that you're doing with them. Uh, anyway, uh, so thank you very much for taking time out of your family time to do the show with us. I'd like to also, of course, as always, thank my spirit guide, Greg, for his lovely lovely input and his presence here for for all of us today so please all of you have a thank you so much have a very very blessed rest of the day everybody and have a very very blessed uh rest of the weekend bye bye